the protection of God is very easy to once you get into prosperity, forget all about what God did. Forget where you came from, forget where you uh, traveled from, forget what it is that God did, forget what it is that God brought you from. And listen, forgetting all about who gave you things in the first place. It's very easy for these hearts of ours to bear unfruitful things like that. And so Solomon did just that. But yet, he was allowed to remain alive, be kept by God, established by God, and maintained by God. Living to the point where he can get in his old age now and give glory back to God. And how he gives glory back to God is to really begin now to tell the emptiness and the foolishness of depending upon stuff. Depending upon people, depending upon places, depending upon things, listen, depending upon your own kingdom and depending upon what it is that you built, what it is that you did, rather than what it is that God has done. And so he goes throughout this book and he shows from personal experience just how our lives ought to be lived and what the top priority ought to remain to be. And so you can title this book Vanity, Emptiness, because over and over again, time and time again, he gives constant examples of depending upon things other than God. He calls it vanity of vanities, emptiness, futility, unfruitfulness. And here's a man who had a lot of production, had a lot of things going, certain things started, you name it, he began it, it flourished, it produced a lot of things, but yet, he shows it didn't produce the very necessary thing that really, truly needed to be done. He shows the mirth. He shows the end of every bit of things that you might enjoy, all the happiness you might get from certain things, but at the end of it is going to be a crying, bleeding heart. One that lives in a lot of regret. One that didn't dedicate itself totally to the Lord, and so now it has a possibly a lot of hatred, possibly a lot of envy, more likely regrets, and a lot of things that it wishes it could have done different. Now, here's a wealthy man. And now you hear a lot of people say, well, if I just had a certain amount of money, I'd be happy. And you hear about a lot of those same people that might get more than enough money, it seems, and the problems are still there. As a matter of fact, the problems are magnified. The more money you get, the more problems you get. The more things you've got, the more hands you've got to dig in it and grab it and take it. The more you accumulate, the more you'll sleep with one eye open if you don't know the Lord. Realizing that God is the one that's supposed to sustain. Listen, you'll never be totally secure without God. I don't care what you've got. As a matter of fact, it's possible to accumulate a lot of things, a little bit of God, and be more fearful on that side than you were when you even started. Why? Because you're trying to secure it, trying to maintain it. Worry about who's going to take it. And that's a vexing life. That's a life that's full of frustration, being annoyed trying to ensure everything, trying to secure everything, all without God, not trusting in God. That's a very empty way to be. And so that's just what he explained throughout this book. And when you've got time, uh, take the time to read all the way through it. Listen, you might want to read it over and over again. Let it sit deep down inside of your soul. So when the next time you get in the middle of a hot pursuit of things and people and wealth and health and identity and things other than God, listen, you'll remember this man's testimony. You remember how, listen, just how he got caught up in stuff. And here was somebody who was dependent upon God. He prayed for wisdom, prayed for discernment, put it into practice. He knew just what it would do, but then eventually he did what? Drifted away from it. And so he showed the danger in it. And so you and I can get in the middle of things, getting blessed by God, and still be able to recognize the danger in drifting away from God. And so I want you to look at what he says in chapter 9. And, of course, he gives quite a bit of examples of this empty life. But I want us to focus on chapter 9 for the purpose of this part of our lesson because he's going to show just how important God is and just how less important and meaningless our things are. And so look at what he says in chapter 9 and verse 1. And he's going to show how all things come to the righteous and to the wicked. So even with that, there's no point in thinking that you're better than somebody else or that because you've got a certain position, a certain status, a certain identity, and nothing's going to happen. As a matter of fact, Satan's going to be more attracted to you the more damage are you threatening to do to his kingdom. And so there are certain events, certain things, certain happenings that's just going to take place. Certain things just going to happen. No matter what your position is, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how righteous you are, certain things just going to take place. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And so it all boils down to what? The wisdom of God, seeking what to do in a given situation. So it's not that problems are going to come, it's that when they come, how are you going to solve them? Are you going to do it with your stuff? 
You're going to do it with your education or you're going to do it with God? What's going to really matter when you get in the middle of a situation, a crisis, some kind of setback, some kind of disappointment, some big problem that you have now that you didn't have before? What are you going to do with it? You can't build up enough wealth. You can't build up enough stuff to deal with everything that Satan would throw your way. Certain things will come your way that you won't know what to do with and so you're going to need spiritual blessings. Now there's nothing wrong with material things or physical things. They stay in their place. There's nothing wrong with having it. Yes, it solves certain issues and God blesses with it, but it's not to be worshipped. It's not to be your ultimate security. Listen, it's not to be the thing that defines you. It's not to be the very thing that anchors who you are. It's not your personal identity. It's who you are in Christ. It's having the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and your total, absolute devotion toward him. Because it's going to get to the point where you're going to die. Listen, you're going to be removed from this earth. That's the one thing that's going to happen to every single person. And so what matters ultimately is the state of your soul, how you lived your life, and how you're going to solve the ultimate problem, which is uh, where your soul is going to spend eternity. So look at what he says in chapter 9. I want you to see verse 1. He says, for all this I considered in my heart. Now, I want you to keep in mind as we read this, is that Solomon is reflecting back on his life. Remember, he's done everything now. He's purchased everything, built everything, just about been everywhere, had everybody come to him. He's, listen, you name it, he's living. He can tell you all kinds of stories that would fascinate the average person. And so he's looking back and he's reflecting and he's comparing his life full of all this stuff that he's accumulated with a life that's supposed to be totally dedicated to the Lord. He says, for all this I uh, considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. To the good and to the clean, to the unclean, to him that sacrifices, to him that sacrifice not. As the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth, as that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. So everybody's going to die. Certain events take place, but everybody eventually is going to die no matter what you've got. And verse 4 he says, For to him that is joined to all, the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. He says, For the living know not that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. So that's it. He says, neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. And so he's making it clear the vanity and the emptiness of living your life for stuff. Everybody's going to die. And also, you can't carry one single thing with you. And so just like Jesus made it clear, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? He shows at the end of the whole thing, it's going to be nothing but death to everybody. Whether you're righteous or whether you're a sinner, there's going to be death. And so the most important thing is where you're going to spend absolute eternity. And so he goes on, uh, if you remember, all the way down to chapter 12. And uh, at the end of that, at the end of all this living, after all this indulgence, after all this life, at the end of chapter 12, uh, what he says in verse 13 is, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. That is the end of everything, no matter what. No matter how something gets started, the bottom line is where is it going to end up? The bottom line is how is it going to be complete? So what do I do at the end of it? I got it. I bought it. I lived in it. I purchased it. I've been here. I've been there. Now what? I've been all over the place, all over the globe. I've been to the moon and back. Now what? And so what Solomon, with all of his experience, this solid advice that he gives to anybody is this, in verse 13 of chapter 12. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the bottom line. He says, fear God. That is, put your total, absolute trust in God. Not in things, not in people. He says, in God. He says, and keep his commandments. That is, live your life, your heart, your mind, your soul, totally governed by the law of God. That's the way to have true success. Again, 
Uh, this is coming from a man who, by the world standards, had ultimate success, had every single thing he ever could hope for and aspired for. But at the end of it, he says, all you have to do in order to have true joy and true happiness is to fear God, keep his commandments. He says, for this is the whole duty of man. This is all you really got to do. And so while the world is chasing after this and that and the other, and while you might think you got to do this, that and the other, he says, this is your whole duty. And people may be confused about what to do and uh, how they ought to live their life and who they need to impress and who they need to live for. Or Solomon makes it clear. He says, this is the whole duty of man. Fearing God, keeping his commandments. He says, for God, watch this, for God shall bring every work into judgment. That is, everything that you and I do, every motive that you and I have, every agenda that you and I run on is going to come up under the judgment of God. It's going to be tried by fire. And so it's going to be tried to see what purpose it was done for. Was it done for you? Was it done for somebody else? Or was it done to glorify God? It's the fire that's going to come up under it. So that's what he's saying. He said, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now it'll cause any one of us to fear God, knowing that everything we do is going to be judged by the one who searches your heart, the one who knows the depths of your heart, not the shallow superficial surface of what it is that you've got or what it is that you do that may impress other people, may get a round of applause or recognition from other people. But God knows your heart. Listen, he knows why you did it. He knows what your purpose is. Listen, you might fool a lot of other people, but he knows why you did a certain thing. He knows why you accumulated a certain thing. He knows why you put something ahead of him. Listen, he knows why you wanted the recognition. And he knows where your priorities are in life. And he knows where his position is in your life. And so you might get away with impressing people, but where heaven is concerned, it's not impressive at all. It's not done for the glory of God. Because everything is going to come into judgment and it's going to show whether you did it for God or not. And so that's what Solomon says about this whole idea of vanity. And so that goes to show, listen, how you and I need to separate the plans and the motives and the programs that we have that's not for God from the things that ought to be of God. And so if it's not done for God, you got to get with the program. you got to get with God's plan. Find out what God's exclusive preordained plan and purposes for your life and the fruit that he wants to bring for you. And I can tell you that's going to line up with this book. And it's going to involve sacrifice. It's going to involve obedience to God. And it's going to go against the grain of the world standard. A lot of people are not going to understand it. A lot of people are not going to accept it. It's going to look foolish to the world. It's going to look foolish to people around you. In fact, it may look foolish to you. But yet it's the very thing that God has called you to do and it's going to bring about the reward that God wants you to have that will bring about the fruit in life that's supposed to bring the favor that you need to have and then the joy and the happiness that you need to have in order to exterminate vanity and vexation. Take your Bible if you will. I want you to go to Ephesians and go to Ephesians chapter 1 and what you're going to see is the Apostle Paul and Paul has this strong motive this strong desire to feed God's people, and in particular in this region, he wants to make sure uh, that they're being mature in the things of God. Now, Paul is one also who can talk about this because he went from one mindset to another. He had a very religious, self-righteous mindset, uh, being born a Jew and in the Roman uh, province. His parents were uh, Pharisees, and he went on to become a Pharisee himself and part of the Sanhedrin. In fact, he had got so dead, empty in religion and his vain thinking that he had told himself that uh, pretty much he was doing the work of God to persecute Christians. And so Jesus Christ, if you remember, stopped him right dead in his tracks with that kind of thinking, redirected his thinking and set him on motion to do one of the greatest works that need to be done. And that is to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom, preach uh, the righteousness through Christ to Jews and to the Gentiles and bring everybody on one accord in Christ. And so now that's Paul's passion, is to put everybody we possibly can in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in things, not in certain careers, not in the law, not in status, but in Jesus. And so you'll see all throughout these epistles where the Apostle Paul drives home the base message of making sure that everybody knows their purpose and their status and their position is in Jesus Christ. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, the true temple, 
the true building is our lives being totally submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're vain, you're empty, you're worthless without Christ. He's not judging, but he's telling the truth that you're empty without the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you might be full of a lot of things. Your life might be full of a lot of things. You may have gone a lot of places, but without Jesus, you're nothing. And so he makes that clear. In fact, there are a lot of people who are teaching otherwise that, yes, you can have your Jesus thing, but hold on to the law. Hold on to the circumcision. So it's Jesus plus this. Listen, Paul shows it's not about that. Listen, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Scrap all those other things. It's all about Jesus. And so when you talk about the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, listen, he wants to make certain, absolutely sure, that they know that they need to mature in the things of Christ. And the reason why he drives that home, because in that region, you had a lot of things that were going on where uh, idol worship was, was concerned, uh, pagan worship was concerned, a lot of mysticism and spirituality and all these kind of devilish things and witches and all that uh, kind of stuff. And so Paul wanted to make sure that they didn't blend in with that and make sure that they didn't kind of merge in with that kind of worldly devilish thinking. He wanted them to mature in Christ. And also, he didn't want them to be religious. He didn't want them to be stagnant. He didn't want them to put their affections in their hope and stuff. He wanted them to put their affections in their hope in the risen Savior, who was alive and on inside of their lives, and was going to return soon and very soon. That's where their hope needed to be. And so if you look all throughout the book of Ephesians, from chapter 1 and chapter 6, you'll see where Paul talks about maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ and the true blessings that the believer has in the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the things that he really wanted to make them know is that they have the epitome of all that needs to be desired in Christ and that they have their affections anchored in spiritual blessings. So that means don't chase after material blessings because listen, you got everything you need with the spiritual blessings in Christ. And so he wanted them to know their position in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you will, we're going to go to chapter 4, but look at chapter 1. And look at what the Apostle Paul says, and I want you to look at uh, verse 3. First, look at what the Apostle Paul says in uh, verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, uh, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he's talking about grace, Listen, this is not just some brief, cliche sort of greeting that he gives. It has a lot of meaning. And he's talking about, the, listen, the grace of God. That's the undeserved favor that comes from God, which is more than enough for your life. Everything that you need. And Paul wanted to make sure their focus is that that's coming from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, and peace from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he's talking about peace, the peace of God <clears throat> is the opposite of vexation. Amen. And so that joy, that security, and that peace is coming from the favor of God. Exclusively through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's not split and divided with the world. There's not this great degree of peace that you're going to get from materialism and also over here this other avenue of peace and grace that you're going to get just from Jesus. No, the only grace and peace that you really need and that you're going to get is through God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. Paul drives that home uh, first and foremost. He says, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at what he says in verse 3. And he's about to talk about our spiritual blessings in Christ. That is in the Lord Jesus Christ, our spiritual blessings. Because you got a lot of people that say, well, God bless me with this, bless me with that. They run down a whole list of all the things that they want and use a lot of material things. But how many people pray for spiritual blessings. God, give me more spiritual blessings. I need to be a better person. I need to be a better man, a better woman, better husband, better uh, father, a uh, better parent, a uh, better whatever, better business person, you name it. God, I need more spiritual blessings in order to do it. I need to be fueled by your spirit. A lot of people forget about the fact that it's the Holy Spirit that fuels you. That gives you all the food that you need to get the spiritual work done and that's manifested in the natural. A very shallow, superficial prayer will be to accumulate a lot of physical things yeah. to do spiritual work. As a matter of fact, that will prove to be very unfruitful. Yeah. But when you and I keep our mindset in the heavenlies, when you and I keep our mindset on spiritual blessings, that keeps God top priority. 
that keeps the kingdom top priority. And all the other things, just like Jesus said about seeking the kingdom, will come next. And it shows that we don't run the risk of worshiping stuff or worshiping people. But yet we realize that the source uh, of our strength and everything that we need spiritually, all the energy that we need, all the power and the strength that we need is coming from the Holy Ghost. And then that's going to affect everything else. That's where your faith and your hope and your desires is anchored and all the spiritual blessing that we receive. So with that said, look at what the Apostle Paul says in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. See that? Amen. That is, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Well, somebody will say, well, I got all these physical needs that need to be met. Well, you got spiritual blessings in Christ if you're saved. So therefore, everything that needs to be done in your life will be done according to the grace, favor, and will of God. Based on the peace that you have in God. And I'm going to tell you what else it will do. It will anchor you even if physical situations don't change. And so those who are anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ, let me be very carefully. Those who are anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ with their focus on the kingdom, with their focus on spiritual blessings, even if certain things don't change quick in the physical, they have peace with God and peace of mind in God. Yeah. Even though the situation hasn't changed yet, even certain things don't take place, a person whose mind is in the heavens can say, even God, listen, God, even if things don't change, I still got peace with you. Even if this physical stuff doesn't get here, even if things don't be enough, I'm still blessed and anchored in the heavens with you. My spiritual blessings are secure in you. You are still God. You are still King of Kings. You are still Lord of Lords, regardless of my physical state. That's somebody who's living a life for fruit. And when somebody else sees and you witness to the fact that God is top priority in your life and that you're focused on the spirit of God in spite of what's happening, that's a testimony to the peace of God being anchored in your life. I'm going to tell you, it'll bless you and it'll bless somebody else. That you can have peace in the midst of suffering. And anything that happens or doesn't happen in your life, your mindset is in the heavenlies. I want to tell you that that's something that the world will not do. The world will gripe. The world will complain. The world will try to change things. The world will get far and far away from God. Handling things they want, the way they want to handle it. Getting all in their flesh, getting vexed, getting envious, getting jealous. But those who are in Christ will be anchored in the spiritual blessings of God and experience the favor of God regardless of any situation because they know who is totally, absolutely in charge. Amen. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He says the blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Having your focus totally on the kingdom of God, recognizing that Jesus Christ is first and foremost, and that he does everything that he's going to do according to his will. Look at verse 4. He says, according, this is how Jesus gets things done. This is how the Spirit of God gets things done. He says, according, that is in harmony with, as he has chosen us. Now watch this. This all applies to the believer. Now keep in mind, it's not just anybody. There's not to be thrown around to everybody. This is only for those who have repented, and by faith accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior and has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He says, according uh, as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ, uh, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And verse 6 he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7 he goes on to make a further note of this package. He says, in whom we have redemption, that is the purchase price was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ through his blood, which was absolutely perfect, and sufficient to take care of our sins. He says the forgiveness of sins. That is complete forgiveness of sins. He says according to the riches of his grace. That means his grace is totally sufficient to cover every single need. Including the forgiveness of sins. Which is nothing short of that. Everything short of that is totally secure. That's what you and I have by knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he can take care of every single problem that you've got. There's nothing you and I have to chase aside from knowing Jesus. And so this is the package that we have. He says in verse 5, wherein 
He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That word prudence means understanding. He says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. That's not the emptiness that's in the world. He said, according to his good pleasure, that is what it is that pleases God. And so you and I as believers are in harmony with what pleases God. And so when Jesus is at the heart of our hearts and that our desires are affected by the Holy Ghost, you and I begin to pray according to the will of God for our lives. And that's the assurance that you and I have that we'll receive what it is that we ask for. Because we're praying in harmony with his will. So that is, God has already said he's going to do it. And so it's just a matter of time before he's going to do it. And you and I agree with God in our prayers in harmony with that. No devil can overtake that. Nobody can overtake that. Amen. You and I have that anchored in us, and that's the hope that you and I have. He says, according to the, ple the good pleasure, which he had purpose in himself, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even unto him. In verse 11 he says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. That is, all the things that we get by being believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things, watch this, after the counsel of his own will. And so God's desires, God's plans, God's purposes over all uh, for the body of Christ, for the world and exclusively toward you is not short and it's not dependent upon the counsel of anything outside of his will. Amen. It's all according to who he is, and God is sovereign. He doesn't consult anybody. And so God's uh, wisdom and God's understanding, of course, and all the things that God does is about the counsel of his will, and everything that he's going to do is according to that. And so if he extends his good pleasure, uh, his gifts, his talents, his favor, his grace, his peace toward those that believe, listen, You've got everything that you need to bear the fruit that you need to have according to the purpose of God's will and your life on this earth. That's not to be measured by anybody else. Now, somebody else might seem like they're doing greater. Somebody else may seem like they're doing more. And how many times have I seen God's people get off track and go line themselves up and measure themselves by what somebody else is doing and what somebody else is accomplishing and the way they're doing something? Listen, it might not be the will of God for their life, let alone be the will of God for your life. You gotta do what God says for you, and listen to me very carefully. Every single act of obedience that you take before God is a, is a successful one. May not line up with everybody else's timetable, everybody else's calendar, or everybody else's will. But if God gave you an instruction, you do it obediently and by faith, that's success. Might not seem big to somebody else. Somebody else might seem like they do something bigger, greater, better, and more significant, but listen, if you've been obedient to God, you've got success. Yeah. According to the kingdom of God, somebody else might do something with one talent. Somebody else might do something with two. Somebody else might do something with five. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to judgment, they're going to hear what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, make you ruler over much. Enter into the joys of my kingdom, which is enough. There's nothing big, nothing small in the kingdom of God. The world does its competitions, the world does its comparisons, and the kingdom of God, that's not something that uh, you and I do. So finally, uh, I'm going to have to kind of wrap it up. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says on the same lines of this empty living uh, that the uh, uh, King Solomon had talked about. Now in between that, at the end of chapter 1, you'll see where uh, the Apostle Paul prayed a very earnest prayer for this church in Ephesus. Uh, for knowledge and understanding. Now notice, this is the very prayer that King Solomon prayed for as far as handling uh, the blessing of God and dealing with Israel. Now, uh, Paul prays for this church in Ephesus. Of course, it's for any believer, but he starts it off praying for uh, this church of Ephesus. And listen, he's not praying for a bunch of material things for them. He's not running down a list of all kinds of things for status. He's praying for their knowledge and understanding being increased. That's what he knows that they need in order to handle and maintain the favor of God. Now to understand, listen, what to do with it. Not just having something, but what do you do with it? You need knowledge. You need understanding. You need wisdom. You know how to work it out according to God's will. And so people have stuff they don't know what to do with. 
And so consult God with what to do. And Paul knew that eventually these believers would fall off track in their uh, devotion to God, their fellowship with God, and knowing who they were in Christ. And so he prays very earnestly for what? Knowledge and understanding. They maintain knowledge and understanding. Not just any knowledge and understanding, but a knowledge of the truth. Constantly being reminded of the truth, which Jesus says shall make you free. And understanding from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gives understanding about who Jesus is. He gives you understanding about Jesus and what God is doing and uh, your purpose uh, as far as God's will is concerned and what the Holy Spirit is doing and what things are coming to pass. And so God gives knowledge of the truth based on his word and understanding based on God's purpose and based on God's will through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's constant. That's continual. Listen, that's something that we always truly are going to need. And so what you see in Ephesians is pretty much from Ecclesiastes, the completion of the whole matter. Now remember, uh, what King Solomon said was that the end of it, the conclusion was to fear God and keep his commandments. Yeah. Plain and simple as that, just lean upon God. And so, of course, again, for the 50th time, he recognized that his wealth, his health, his prosperity, his military might, all these kind of things that he put together was not enough. It all had to be about fearing God. So now what you see in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians that you see the Holy Ghost operating through the Apostle Paul in showing him the completion of everything. And the results of fearing God and keeping God's commandments was really all wrapped up in one. The fulfillment of the commandment of God is in Jesus and that's in love. Loving Lord Jesus Christ, loving our neighbor as thyself, just as plain and simple as that. And knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. So what you see is the Apostle Paul showing the completion of what it is that King Solomon said needed to be. Fearing God, keeping his commandments. How do you do that? With this flesh, it's going to be very difficult to do it in and of yourself, so you need Jesus. Here's the Apostle Paul showing just what needed to be. Your position in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what brings about your purpose. That's what will keep you constantly in the fear of God <clears throat> through the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, it will give you constant knowledge and understanding. So here's the completion. You can say the completion is Jesus Christ. He completes every single thing in your life. Now somebody might say, well, I've got a ball of problems, a whole big list. You name it, I've got it. Well, Jesus is the completion of it. Well, I don't know. Well, Jesus, who knows the beginning from the end, knows how it's going to turn out. He knows what he wants it to do, and he's got the power to bring fulfillment to your life and complete every single thing that needs to be completed. Well, this is just a mess. And I don't know if anybody can do anything with this. Well, Jesus can might be a thing where somebody else can't handle it, but Jesus, listen, Jesus knows just what to do with it. And so making Jesus the very center, the very solution center, and everything in our lives will totally secure us in the success that we need to totally have. What you see with that is the completion found with what the Apostle Paul says is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what you have uh, in the book of Ephesians. As a matter of fact, that's what you have throughout the whole entire New Testament and the New Covenant is Jesus Christ being the end of all things. And so look at chapter 4, if you will. And I want you to take a look at verse 17. And I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul says. He's talking about the new life in Jesus Christ. The, listen, the brand new life in Jesus. So if you're talking about a brand new life, that means it was an old one. That old one was empty. It was fruitless, it was vain, and it was headed for permanent total destruction. But now this new life, not a new life because it's got a lot of brand new uh, substances, it's got a lot of brand new possessions. It's a new life because it's in Christ. Amen. It's in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus makes everything new. You've been born again, and he shows you just what to do. And so Paul is talking about the brand new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So look at what he says in verse 17. First, I want to read verse 16. He says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make of increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So you remember I said everything is in love now. The fulfillment of the commandments of God. The fear of God in the life of the believer is held together by the Lord Jesus Christ, the same one who holds the body of Christ together. That's the same one that's going to hold you together. The same one that's going to hold me together. So that's what the Apostle Paul shows, that he's going to do that according to his will, according to love. That's how you and I establish and God's love does not run out. God's love constantly remains. And so that being that God's love remains, you and I remain. And that is what produces the fruitful life. And so verse 17, look at what he says. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, 
that ye henceforth, that is from now on, being that you have a brand new position in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are anchored in love, all things are passed away, uh, things are made new. He says, listen, he says that ye henceforth, that is from now on, he says, walk not, that means live, not as other Gentiles, that means non-believers, walk. He says, in the vanity of their mind. Amen. And so he says that those who are not in Christ have a very fruitless mindset and a heart that's not dedicated to the will of God. He says, don't walk or live your life according to that way, according to that lifestyle. Don't measure yourself that way. He said, listen, that mindset is empty and it's going to lead to vexation. And they're going to be constantly chasing after the wind. Grabbing after the water, trying to make balls out of water. He said that's annoying, frustrated, very worrisome life to live. Yeah. He says that's vanity, that's empty. It's not going to really lead to anything. It's not really going to bring forth fruit. And so Paul gives the admonition. He says, walk not as other Gentiles walk. That means live not as they live. He says in the vanity or the futility of their mind. He goes on to explain in verse 18, he says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He says, Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. That's absolute lawlessness in their life. And so when a person is living their life according to lasciviousness, that means they're just absolutely out of control. And their passions and their desires and their flesh is what? Out of control completely. And so somebody who's living a life of lasciviousness is not living according to the law of God at all. And not even thinking about God. And so therefore, their mind is going to be fruitless because it's not glorifying God. It's doing the things of the devil. And ultimately, it's going to lead to uh, eternal damnation. And so Paul is saying, don't live according to that. He says, he says they live according to lasciviousness. He says to work all uncleanness. And greediness. He says in verse 20, he says, But ye have not, he says, But ye have not so learned Christ. He says, If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. In verse 22, he says, That ye put off concerning the former conversation, that is the former lifestyle, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. He says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, verse 24, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That is, being totally, absolutely, completely set apart for the work of the Lord, having your mind being renewed and not fashioned according to the things of the world. In closing, I want to ask you this. People may chase, people may run after quite a bit of things and quite a bit of position and accumulate other stuff, even in the physical house. But what if Jesus Christ wanted to have just about a three-hour conversation with you in your home today? Set an appointment, he'd come over and sit down in your living room, your dining room or whatever, and just have a discussion about your home. Discussion about your life. And all the things that needed to be. What would the conversation sound like? What kind of questions would you have for Jesus Christ? What kind of counsel would you seek with all the issues, with all the problems that you've had up to that point? It's a few hours with the Lord sitting at your table and he wants to straighten everything out in your life. On top of that, he's willing to answer every question you've got, straighten out every problem you've got, but give you all the instructions that's needed for you to carry out, to do the things that need to be done. And then after that, he wants to go in every single room. And he wants to look around and listen. He wants to straighten out what needs to be straightened out. And on top of that, he wants to remove what needs to be removed. Mm, amen. I wonder what kind of impact that would have on your life. I wonder what kind of resistance you would show him. I can guarantee that he would say and point out some things that you just do not want to hear. I guarantee he'd remove some things that you hold dear and that you hold very sacred in your life because what he would do is show you where he's not in it, possibly where he's never been involved. I wonder, would you argue with Jesus? I wonder, would you say, no, don't take that, don't touch that. I wonder, would you say, you know what, Jesus, I know you said this, but I've got this. 
In fact, I've had it all this time. I don't need no help with that. But yet Jesus, the one who searches your hearts, knows everything you need. And he knows just what you need to do. And you're going to tell him that you caught it? And even certain things that he can't have it? And it belongs to him? Or either what's worse than that, it has nothing to do with him at all? And you're going to tell Jesus no? Well, although Jesus physically has not come into your home, he's around. Amen. And he's omnipresent. And he's powerful. And he's been trying to get in. And he's been trying to clean stuff up. And he's been talking to you about certain things. You might not have answered the phone, but he's talking. You might be ignoring it, but he's steadily talking. And he wants to straighten certain things out. Listen, you might be holding it, but it's his. And a lot of things you stole. And there's a lot of things he wants back. There's a lot of things that do not glorify him. And he wants it out. And you're holding on to it. And you're holding right on to your relationship with the devil. And not giving any kind of heart toward him. And I can tell you what's worse than that. There are people who are totally, absolutely acquainted, acquainted with the devil. And at the same time, trying to get acquainted religiously with God. Yes. But Jesus says, I want full rule, full reign. As a matter of fact, you invited me over for three hours, but I want to stay here. I want to live here. And I'm not living in this junk. Hey. So if I'm going to be here, some stuff got to go. Amen. This is empty. This is futile. This is what's bringing about your frustration. This is what's causing you to be annoyed. You haven't totally figured it out. Listen, this is what you're worried about. I want to take it out. And there are too many people that's holding on to trash. And that's the reason why Jesus will not reside there. I wonder will you allow Jesus to be the master contractor, the cleanup crew that needs to come in and get all that vain, empty, futile stuff out of your life so he can rule and reign in your life so you can bring forth fruit for the kingdom. Amen. Amen.
something's got to be happening. So it's not happiness that you want. We're talking about your hair in the room. Somebody needs your in the room. You know it. Jesus is my doctor. And he rides on the yeah. And he gives me faith except the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord and personal Savior. Just as simple as that. That's the way to get saved. There's no paperwork, no kind of things you have to clean up. Just come in sick and recognize that you need a Savior and that you need your sins to be forgiven and that Jesus Christ is the only doctor. He's the only way. Listen, he's the master that can really truly get everything done. He did it over 2,000 years ago. The work was complete on the cross by his shed blood that was perfect. He was our sinless Savior. He establishes justification. He's our substitutionary, atoning, all-sufficient death that was beat, that met the requirements of God, his righteous standards, on behalf of the believer. It applied over 2,000 years ago. It applies right here and right now in 2023. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ today. Just accept him into your life. If you're here, wherever you're watching from, it's as simple as saying, Lord, I need you as my Lord and personal Savior. I can't forgive my own sins. I need my sins to be forgiven. Yeah. I want eternal life. And I trust and believe that you will do it. He'll come into your life. And your life will be absolutely established, not temporarily, but permanently and forever through him. You'll be sealed until the day of redemption and through eternity. You'll be in the kingdom of God forever. It's absolutely that simple. Don't go away from this earth without having done that. By them, it's too late. Once your body, soul, and spirit separate, it's too late. You're going to have to give an account for all your sins. You're going to have to pay for them. And you don't have enough to pay for your sins, past, present, and future. You just don't have it. And there's not one single thing that you can take with you. Nothing will be acceptable before God. Not all your good works, not all the bad stuff you didn't do, it won't be acceptable, not one single bit, before a holy and righteous God. What he's looking for is the blood of Jesus Christ to cover you. He's not looking at you, looking at me, and all the things that we do, and all the things that we've done. He's looking at what Jesus Christ's son did on our behalf, and whether or not you have acquainted yourself with him in right relationship and got full, total coverage for your soul. That's the full assurance, the full coverage that you and I have upon death yeah. or upon Jesus Christ's return is that we're covered. I want to ask you today, are you covered? I'm not asking you about your car. I'm not asking you about your medical insurance. I'm not asking you about your life insurance. I'm asking you about your soul. Is your soul covered today? You might have all those other things covered. You might have plenty of money in the bank and you think you got it all together, but what if your soul were required of you tonight, is your soul covered. Yeah. All the coverage in the world, you might have a million dollar policy, yeah. but it's not enough Hallelujah. to deal with your soul. Yeah. Your soul need to be covered. You know how to get it covered? By the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Believing in his bloodshed for you personally yeah. on the cross and how it's applied to you right here and right now. It doesn't run out. It's totally beneficial for eternity. 
accept it into your life, to get covered. You don't know what the day may bring. You got plans for tomorrow, a lot of people got vacations planned for next month, there's no guarantee that you'll get to it. There's no guarantee you'll get out of this day. I want to ask you again, is your soul covered? A lot of people put more trust and faith in their insurance policy, but is your soul covered? with the full coverage of the blood of Jesus. It needs to get that way. Or maybe you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, but you drifted away. You've had some disappointments, some setbacks. Some things happened, some things didn't happen. And uh, you're upset with God. Truth be told, you're angry with God. And so you got uh, yourself miles and miles away from fellowship with God. And you're trying this, you're trying that, and you're trying the other. I can tell you it's not going to be enough. None of it's going to be enough. And don't waste your service away. Don't waste your life away with vain, empty activities that have nothing to do with the will of God, the call of God, or the plan of God for your life. Maybe you're attached to too many other people. You're trying to fit in with too many others. Maybe your life lived with somebody else and meeting their approval is more important to you than Jesus. Listen, you need to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ because they can't stand with you in judgment. You're going to have to give an account for you all by yourself in judgment. Not mother, not father, sister, brother, wife, husband, none of that kind of stuff. Children, none of them can stand with you in judgment. This is no group thing. You're not going to get called by committee. You're going to get judged based on what you did first and foremost. A lot of people are going to offer a lot of excuses. Oh, well, my mother, well, my father. Well, I didn't ask you about your mother, your father asked you about you and your relationship with me. What did you do for me? Your heart is going to be searched. Your motives are going to be searched. And all the acts of obedience that God wanted you to take that you reject is going to come up in judgment. Listen, you want to be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's an exclusive reward for you. Some people you're going to have to get away from. Some people you're going to have to move, put a lot of space and distance between you and them while you get things together. They may catch up later on. Hopefully by the grace of God they will. But the bottom line is right now you've got to go on with the Lord. I love you and all, but right now i got to do what i got to do for the Lord. Now, if that's a problem, God going to help you out. If you're having a difficult time humbling yourself with that, oh, God will give you plenty of help. He'll put a lot of pressure on you. And a lot of people have been playing with God. They've been playing with matches, ignoring this thing. But listen to me very carefully. It's going to get to the point where certain things are going to come avalanching down on your life. And you don't want that to take you out completely. And you've lived your life empty. Not doing what you could have done for the Lord. Because of something else that was more important to you. Come on back and recommit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. A recommittal to your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not churchiness, not a building, none of that kind of nonsense. Committing to the Lord Jesus Christ and your relationship with Him permanently. And how you fellowship with Him. That's what you need to come back to. Rekindle that fire that you once had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. If either one of those is you, I want to talk to you after service. I want to hear what's on your mind. And uh, so we, we can straighten out some things where by the grace of God I can answer whatever questions that you have. And hopefully by the grace of God guide you in the right direction. Uh, let us pray. Dear God, I just want to come in the name of Jesus. So we do want to thank you for this opportunity that we've had to come together and uh, just worship you and praise you. I thank you, Lord, for uh, your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your presence. Lord, I just ask that you would continue to strengthen us right now. Dear Lord, bring us together on one accord. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do and everything that you've done. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, and the weapon formed against us will prosper. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us, put up a stronghold for us, Lord, against every demonic attack. Remove everything that's not like you. I ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us in all that we do for you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Our soul says, Amen. amen. At this time, we're going to stand and give a benediction, and then the deacons are going to take charge off camera. Now may the God of all comfort and grace establish your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore, until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Very happy to see Deacon Frederick with us this morning from New Elizabeth. Amen. Amen.